Thank you, Lynn, and thanks everybody for for showing up today. So the topic today that we we're going to discuss is gut health. I usually prefer, especially for such big topics like this, which could go in so many different directions, rather than me having slides and just talking to everybody, I like to kind of introduce the topic, just as Lynn said, and then kind of hear from all of you what direction you'd like to go in or just get some questions and kind of take it from there. So so gut health, I think, is, um, as I said, a huge topic and a very important one, too. So uh, we're, we're learning more and more over the years about how much what's going on in our gut is affecting our overall health and not just our physical health, but from a, from a body, mind, and spirit perspective as well. So our gut health certainly plays into all of those pieces. Just to start out and maybe just to get us all kind of centered into the space, for any of you, and I do see a few familiar faces, for any of you who um, were there either virtually or in person when I did the chair yoga and mind-body wellness talk a few weeks ago, I talked a little bit about the mind-gut connection and about the vagus nerve. So so I thought it might be nice to do just a really brief, like two minute breathing exercise, which actually plays into this topic of gut health. So just to introduce this a little bit, also if this is a new concept for anybody, the vagus nerve is one of the big nerves that originates in our brain, one of our cranial nerves. So part of our central nervous system originates in the brain and kind of touches most of the important organ systems in the body. One thing that's very interesting about this is we can do certain breathing techniques that can help us tap into what this nerve is doing. And one of the really important functions of this nerve is to aid in digestion. And this nerve is also kind of the master controller of the whole part of our nervous system that is responsible for more of the rest and digest functions. And so that's kind of the mirror image of the other piece of the nervous central nervous system, which is part of the fight or flight and all those things that get queued up when we get stressed or anxious or scared or angry and, and whatnot. And so the vagus nerve is, is kind of the master controller of this whole rest and digest piece. So a really um, simple tool that we can have available to us at any time is to do certain types of breathing practices to help tone that nerve. So the breath work practice that I like to do, rather than just pointing someone in the direction of saying, take a deep breath, deep breathing. Deep breathing can mean a lot of things, and I think it can be a little confusing too. But I like to term it more as ratio breathing, where we are breathing in for a certain count and breathing out for a count that's a little bit longer. So for example, if we started out breathing, and you can breathe in and out of your nose if that's comfortable, but if it's not, then you know adjust as per your baseline of how you would breathe on a regular basis. So if we were to start breathing in and out of our nose or, or at our baseline for a count of four in, and a count of four out. So first just starting that, and everybody's count of four may be different. Kind of the more you make it your slow and steady pace that's comfortable, the better, but everybody's pace may be a little different and that's totally fine. So if we start breathing in for four and out for four, and stick with that ratio for a couple more breaths. And then slowly starting to extend your exhale where you're breathing in for four and maybe breathing out for five or six and whatever feels good to you. So breathing in and then breathing out for a longer count. Maybe start with six if that feels okay. You may be breathing in for four, breathe out for six, even consider pausing for a moment at the base of that exhale. And just continue that for two or three more cycles. So this really simple practice of taking these extended exhales and so a way of kind of deep breathing literally kind of cues into that vagus nerve. And so when that nerve cues up, a lot of our functions can kind of calm down. So we may notice our heart rate goes down or our blood pressure, it lowers if we were to measure it before and after. Um, our respiratory rate and our whole body may feel calmer. Some people will notice their muscles relax. So another thing that's going on on the inside is our digestive functions can kind of cue up and function um, more efficiently. Because if we're in acute danger, our body kind of, you know, based on how our bodies have evolved over time, 
our body doesn't put any energy, blood flow, nutrients and such into digestive functions when we're in danger. If we need to run away or get away from something, it's going to put most of that energy into pumping our heart pumping, our blood pressure going up, us be able to breathe fast and cueing um, energy into our muscles so we can do what we need to do. So digestion becomes a less important function. So it's really more when we're resting and our nervous system is calm that we're able to digest efficiently. So that's why I like to kind of start there. Another thing that maybe can um, stimulate some some thoughts and questions or um, where everyone would like to go with our discussion is when we think about gut health, I also like to kind of zoom out a little bit and think about what's involved in the whole digestive process. So starting first from that mind-gut connection and just mentally, um, what, what's the connection between our brain and our, and our gut? Oftentimes you may hear the gut referred to as the second brain. And it's called that because we literally have a whole nervous system in our gut called the enteric nervous system that produces important hormones. For example, a great deal of our serotonin is produced in the gut. Um, and this mind-gut connection is kind of like a, um, a two-way highway. So it's not like one affects the other in one direction, but it goes in both ways. And so, for example, we often feel emotions in our gut, and that's something I'm sure everybody can relate to. So if you're you know excited to have butterflies in your tummy or you have a gut feeling about something, we literally feel something in our gut. And the reason is because of that mind-gut connection. Um, in a very similar way, we can... You know, somebody who, for example, may have um, irritable bowel syndrome or sensitive gut may notice that they get um, stressed out, they have to run to the bathroom or things like that. And so that's very, in a very similar way, that mind gut um, connection. And so too, even uh, the, the way in which we uh, eat our foods, whether we're, you know, eating quickly while also answering emails and doing stuff all at the same time, we may not digest as well versus if we're to be present, you know, with a loved one and sitting and enjoying a meal. Well, I wanted to check in. It was, did any um, questions or thoughts come up so far? He wants to know if the breathing exercise helps with excess phlegm or mucus that's accumulating in the throat. Interesting. Okay, well, that's an interesting thought. I think it certainly could. Um, it would probably depend on what the source of the excess phlegm was, because that can also be, you know, very various things that may be contributing. For example, of course, it could be, you know, post nasal drip or sinus related, or it could be even um, sometimes from dry mouth, people can kind of get um, thicker phlegm, or it could be from reflux. So that's something that's coming from 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 the lower part of the yeah, the, you know, the, the stomach and the esophagus and coming up. So that could cause excess phlegm. So it would probably one, depend on what the source is. Certainly if it's coming from more of an upper respiratory source, I think that could help. Even if it was coming from something like reflux, I think that could help because reflux can also um, be triggered by by stress or kind of overactivation of that fight or flight piece of the nervous system. So, so I guess in a sense, yes, I think that could help. But not in the um, case of... Uh, dry mouth. I think um, in, in my case, I think it's it's actually both post nasal drip and and dry mouth, neither uh, of which I've had before I encountered uh, lung cancer. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. So that's actually a good segue. So why don't we talk about dry mouth a little bit just for a second? Because that's part of that was kind of the next piece of um, where I was going with this. Let's think about the whole gut. So start in the mind. Then we think about chewing, swallowing, saliva production, you know, swallowing and, and so on. So for dry mouth, for example, um, which certainly certain cancer treatments and radiation and such can, can cause that um, even as a new problem for someone. So a few just um, tips and tricks that may be useful. Aloe vera is one of my favorite, I guess, food or supplement, supplementary type things that can be really helpful for gut health almost from top to bottom. So aloe vera, like 100% aloe vera juice or gel, which you would get more at like a health food store or some grocery stores, actually acts like an anti-inflammatory for the gut. So specifically for dry mouth, one thing that I've suggested to folks is to make, and this can also apply for mouth sores too, to actually make aloe vera ice cubes. So if you were to get aloe vera juice and put it in an ice cube tray and then just keep the, let the ice cubes melt in your mouth before eating or drinking, that can actually be um, kind of nourishing to the tissues 
and can uh, can can be an anti-inflammatory. And so we had a really good question. So aloe with or without aloe. So that's a very good question. So aloe is one of the compounds that's in the um, leaf of the aloe vera plant. Um, aloe can have for some people, a pretty strong laxative effect. So oftentimes when you go to, um, you know, if you're at the health food store and you see aloe vera juice, um, it will say either inner filet or inner gel or whole leaf. So the, the inner filet will just be that jelly stuff. And that does not have that high concentration of the aloe in. So that's primarily where that like soothing anti-inflammatory effect is. However, the whole leaf part can have a benefit because that includes the inner gel plus that outer leaf part which then will have more of a laxative effect. So if I have somebody who is experiencing, you know, um, reflux or dry mouth, et cetera, but also having a lot of trouble with constipation, I may have them use that whole leaf version. So that will have more of the laxative effect versus the other, which is not so much going to be a laxative, but can act as an anti-inflammatory for the whole gut. So even can be helpful for if there's any inflammation in the esophagus or reflux, or even in the lower gut, any trouble with bowel movements. But that's a really good question. Well, can I just follow that up since you mentioned constipation? And I, sure. I, some, I've been dealing with that as well. And the way that I've been dealing with it is um, not via this, which I hadn't heard of before, but via uh, taking uh, Seneca uh, uh, at night uh, once a day and also taking Colase, a stool softener. And I wonder uh, how you feel about those. Yeah, that's a really good question. I think because that's um, bowel movements and, and managing constipation is such an important topic. I think let's just segue into that and we'll go from there. So it's a really good question. So, um, so first, you know, with regards to constipation, question one is thinking about what is, you know, what's causing it, just like with anything going on in our body. So we want to, you know, sometimes that can be medication induced, especially if it's, um, pain medications and stuff, but also certain chemo drugs or other prescription medications, over-the-counter medicines can cause constipation. So first, just kind of as like the simplified baseline, the three things that we need to keep our balance functioning. So this is kind of like the bottom of the pyramid would be fiber, which I would say number one should come from non-starchy forms of vegetables if you're able to digest those fine. So fiber, but you know, fiber supplements and stuff will be in the second tier. So let's just start with dietary fiber, number one. So non-starchy vegetables, and then also certain foods um, considered prebiotics, which that's also a whole other section of the maze we can go down, but we'll come back to that. The second is water. So making sure that we're getting adequate hydration in order to, to add to that fiber. Because we can take all the fiber we want in the world, but if we're not hydrated enough, we can always make us more constipated. So, so fi dietary fiber, water, just a general baseline. Again, this can be um, dependent on an individual person's health condition, but a general good baseline is about half of your body weight in ounces of water. In terms of hydration, unless any certain medic medication makes it unpalatable for you to have warm or um, hot beverages, in general, room temperature or warmer fluids are better for your digestion than like iced fluids. Not that you can, you know, never want to drink iced water, but it would be best to kind of sip room temperature or warmer water through the day than be always drinking ice water or drinking a whole bunch of water prior to a meal or during a meal where that may actually dilute our digestive enzymes a little bit. The one strategy that I even do myself, because if I don't track my water intake, I tend to just forget through the day and, you know, three o'clock comes and I've barely drank any water. So I carry around a refillable cup. I measure it out at the beginning of the day and, you know, make sure I get at least, you know, 60 or so ounces of water per day. So, um, so that's two. And then three is physical movement. So the physical movement of our body, even if we are, um, you know, in a wheelchair bound or what have you, a physical movement of um, however we do that in our day to day physically moves the gut and encourages things to, to keep moving. So that's kind of that tier one of the foundation for gut health. So that's, that's where I would start if I'm thinking about what's causing constipation. Am I getting enough of those three things? And then tier two, we could think about stuff like, you know, um, fiber supplements, prebiotic, probiotic, etc. So um, fiber supplements can be useful. I think just like any vitamin or supplement, 
they're um, exactly what what uh, the name says. They're kind of supplementary to these foundational things. So I think fiber supplements are useful when we're, for whatever reason, unable to get enough fiber from dietary sources. So that's where stuff like um, um, psyllium husk, which is what's in Metamucil and um, similar things like that can be useful or um, you know, other fiber tablets and whatnot. And a really good dietary addition that can offer a lot of additional fiber to the diet is a um, ground flax seeds. So ground flax seeds, so flax seeds are those little brown, like kind of sesame seed size um, seeds that are in a lot of whole grain products and things like that. But you can get at pretty much any grocery store, you can get flax seeds and they're already ground up. You want to take, take flax seeds in this ground up form because as a whole seed, um, they're not bad, but they're just too tough for us to digest. So we don't really get all the great health benefits of them. So you can either buy them ground or you can grind them at home in a blender, coffee grinder or something. But I mentioned flax because they're a really good source of fiber. So they can be very helpful for adding fiber to our diet. They're a good food that can feed the healthy bacteria in our gut. So that's kind of where we'll, we'll lead into the probiotic topic. One of the most important things for maintaining our gut health is this population of healthy bacteria that live in our gut. And so flax can be a good food, basically, for those bacteria. The other cool thing about flax is it is a really good source of a plant-based source of omega-3s. So those healthy fatty acids, um, flax is one source of omega-3s. Um, specifically ALA, um, which is one type of omega-3. That's what um, most um, uh, ground sources of omega-3s are versus sources from the ocean, which are fish and algae. So those are the different strains of omega-3s. And then, th and then also, interestingly, for, for women more specifically, if you are menopausal or postmenopausal, women who consume flax seeds on a regular basis can may actually have fewer hot flashes. So that's kind of another cool side effect, I guess, of flax. So, so that is one in terms of fiber. But that's something I, I like to mention because that can be a really inexpensive, useful thing to add in that I think would offer more benefit than like a regular fiber supplement. Um, of course, again, fiber supplements are fine, but would maybe start there and then add something like that if you need. So, okay, so really good question. So are flax seeds estrogenic? So that comes into that that piece about the hormone balancing. They're not. So, so even though they can have this hormone balancing effect, um, they are not pro-estrogenic. So even if somebody has a history of uh, an ER positive cancer, they can still consume flax seeds very safely. Yeah, good way to include in the diet. If anyone has any other suggestions, add them in the chat, but I throw them in a smoothie every morning. I enjoy to, um, and then in my blender, it grinds them up just like that. Um, if you grind the flax seeds kind of in smaller batches as you use them, which you don't have to, that does preserve some of that omega-3 a little better. So you get a bit more of that omega-3 benefit. So I like that. Or if I make oats, I put them in oats. They have a little bit of a nutty flavor. Um, I've even added them into soups or stews. So those are some ways to do it. Really good question about flax oil too. So interestingly, uh, most studies have shown that flaxseed oil does not really offer the same health benefits of whole flax seeds. So that's one thing where there's, there's really no great evidence that like flax oil as a supplement um, offers much health benefit. If you were using it as an oil, like the barley and flax oil and putting it on your salad instead of another type of oil, that would be fine because it's more just a dietary thing, but there wouldn't really be much benefit of like taking flax oil in a capsule for some nutritional need. Um, so that wouldn't really have the same benefits. And then, okay, so kind of coming back to, to, to the original question too, about some of these medicines and things that can help for, for constipation. So it started out with mentioning, you know, let's think about what's the source of my constipation first. So then when we think about medicines or supplements to take to aid with constipation, those are also for different purposes and doing different things. So for example, you know, these fiber supplements we talked about, those are kind of going to help bulk the stool or help encourage, you know, feed the good bacteria in there. And that has one purpose, something like senna, for example, um, which senna is a, is a plant. And so you can get teas that have senna in them, but then senna cot takes that compound and makes it into a medicine. Senna is a stimulant laxative. So it kind of encourages this movement of the gut. So that's a whole other category of things. Something like colase or docusate is a stool softener. So that's doing something different. So we have these kind of bulking agents, 
stimulant laxatives, stool softeners that can encourage, you know, um, to things to move through with more ease. And then there's something like Miralax, which is an osmotic laxative that encourages water flow into the gut, and then that can help move things out. So sometimes we have to think about all of those pieces. If you're taking multiple different ones, that's definitely something you should be discussing with one of your doctors, either your primary care oncologist or integrative physician or whomever. But sometimes, or especially if somebody is acutely constipated and you know has not had a bowel movement in a few days, you may need a combination of a couple of things. So you may need both the stool softener plus the stimulant in order to get things moving versus you know just one or the other. I would also be cautious with the use of stimulant laxatives like Senna um, on an everyday basis for, basis for an ongoing amount of time. Not to say that that's not okay for some people, but if that's something you're starting out with and maybe haven't discussed with a doctor, I would try to avoid doing that every day only because then our gut kind of gets used to it and then kind of needs that to keep things moving. So a, um, a vague, uh, kind of a vague comparison that I've made um, recently is thinking about um, how a lot of us may have coffee in the morning in order to have a bowel movement. So it's sort of similar because coffee helps us have a bowel movement because it stimulates the gut and it's very acidic. So it almost kind of irritates the gut and gets things moving. So, so just in that way, you know, then we may find, oh, I didn't have coffee today and I can't, you know, go to the bathroom and, you know, until later. So that's just one thing to keep in mind. There's a, a tea that I um, often re recommend just for as needed use called Smooth Move Tea. Um, some of you may be familiar with it. It's made by a, a pretty good quality company called Traditional Medicinals. They make really good um, herbal teas. And so they um, do good quality testing and such. And they, everything they make, I believe, is organic because that is important when it comes to teas um, is try to get organic when possible. But the Smooth Move Tea does have senna leaf in it but it has a combination of about eight or so other herbs that make it not super aggressive. If you buy senna tea alone, that can often cause like cramping and stomach discomfort and diarrhea and that for some people. Um, but the smooth move is a good combination of things that tends to be a little gentler. I guess, okay. Well, I think it's one of the, <laughs> sorry, kind of, there's so many directions to go with gut health. I'm kind of, um, um, I think jumping a bit, but let me reel it in and see where, where, what you guys are thinking. Steve, did you have a question? Thought. Yeah, are you suggesting uh, that, uh, that for long-term use, because I've been taking Santa, um, I actually may have, what you said made a lot of sense, because I had been taking two Santa, cot, uh, two Santa pills a night, and I, re and I reduced it to one, um, and maybe that was the source of... Uh, some of the constipation that I had, but are you suggesting, and I started taking, I had been recommended by my GI doctor to take Senna and, and Colace um, and also Culturel, a probiotic. Um, so um, before that I had been taking Miralax, but it didn't seem to work or it seemed to work and give me uh, diarrhea. So, but are you suggesting that Miralax for long-term use may be safer than Senna or, or am I so misinterpreting? Not, um, no, no. So not necessarily. So I think especially, so number one, you're working with your gastroenterologist. So that it, all of these things that I'm suggesting, especially when it comes to medications or supplements, that's a hundred percent of the time is an individualized plan. So there's never going to be like one thing where I'll say everybody should do this um, if it comes to supplements or medicine. So if you're working with a gastroenterologist, and of course, I don't know your whole medical history, but if they had suggested that combination, there's likely a reason. So that's, that's why I put in the caveat of for some people taking Senna or a certain combination of these things is appropriate. And it's just like if somebody was, if I just went to the health food store and bought Senna tablets and started taking them every day without any guidance, that may not be the best approach because that because I didn't have a healthcare pro professional guiding me. But if you're seeing a gastroenterologist and they felt that was best, then that's likely what's best. And good point to mention that they also put in the um, Culturel, which is a good quality probiotic. And that's one that's easy to find. So oftentimes, Again, not for everybody, but a lot of the time adding a probiotic is a helpful piece of the puzzle. 
because that will help encourage more of that good bacteria growth in the gut. Oh, yes. I just got Smooth Move. I never took it before. <laughs> I, I've taken school softeners, Miralac type stuff, but never laxative. So I was nervous. So I haven't taken it yet. But now that you mentioned that it's a little less um, harsh as a laxative, mm-hmm. what time would you suggest I take it? What's, you know, how long until it kicks in? And should I take it in the morning? Should I take it before I go to sleep? I don't want to be woken up in the middle of the night. Yeah, I would, I would do it um, probably uh, maybe an hour or so before bedtime. So you can, you know, drink the tea and uh, perhaps empty your bladder before bed. And then by morning, I think that's oh, okay. actually so it does the take product. Hours. Yeah, we'll take some time. I think the the product um, label even says that. I think it it um, said it was a wide, pretty wide range. I think that it said okay, when I went okay. online and was reading about it, it was kind of a wide range. So I guess it it depends. I just wanted to know what your thoughts were on that. Thank yeah, you. I would probably try it like after dinner time, something like that. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, but it's certainly a good product. I think Teresa maybe has a question. Um, yes, I'm getting back to the aloe vera. If you have a problem with diarrhea, should I still try that? So I think you could very slowly and cautiously try the just the inner gel part. So again, if you were to get the juice, and it doesn't take a lot as well for, and and just back to, Mm. would you be using it specific just kind of for that anti-inflammatory effect? Is that okay? Okay. Um, so I would get the um, just the inner inner gel, you know, juice or gel form, and kind of for most indications, I don't recommend starting with more than two ounces. But if you ha- already have diarrhea, just do like an ounce maybe, and okay. see how you feel. Um, for some people who are really sensitive, GI tract sometimes even just uh, you know um, a tablespoon or so is enough to you know, to, to get things moving, um, that I would say is more with the whole leaf form, but, but yeah, we just start slow. Okay. So that's a good, um, good point too, with a lot of this stuff. So for example, even with probiotics or with adding new fiber to the diet, like fiber supplements or a ground flax seeds or anything, if it would in general, especially if you have anything already going on with your gut, start slow and, and gently increase from there. One thing I'll often um, hear from folks is they say, oh, when I eat really high fiber foods like flax or um, legumes like beans and lentils or um, tofu, then I get really bloated and uncomfortable. So a lot of time why that's happening is because the good bacteria in the gut, again, feed off this fiber in the diet. So if we're suddenly adding a lot of it, that encourages that good bacteria to grow. And so that bacterial growth, if it's quicker than normal, is gas producing. And so that's not necessarily a bad thing what's happening on the inside, but of course it's uncomfortable. So my suggestion would be to start to go really slowly. So so maybe I'm adding ground flax to my diet instead of doing a whole tablespoon, I start with half a teaspoon and then do that for a week or two and then increase it. So then that's feeding that good bacteria, but not in such a dramatic way. So that could be useful too. Debbie has a question. She said that she's found out that ever since her gallbladder was removed, her digestive system has been out of whack. Are there supplements that she can take to help or different foods to eat to help regulate her gut or digestive system? Yeah, that's a good point. So certainly after gallbladder removal, that can be challenging because it's an um, important digestive organ. And a lot of people end up having to get their gallbladder removed. Um, so you may find that you have difficulty tolerating certain um, fatty foods in particular. A lot of the time, more um, meat and dairy can be harder to digest. Well, first, actually, let's talk about the supplements. So so one, for some people, again, this is very variable and I hesitate to... Um, to, to recommend specific supplements and talks, but it's kind of a suggestion that I would then discuss with one of your healthcare providers. But um, sometimes taking a, a digestive enzyme supplement, for example, like plant enzyme supplements, let me look, let me just quickly look up like an example of a brand. Um, but you can get it also a health food store if it's Earth Fair or Berry Farms or wherever you are locally a health food store, if you ask for a plant based digestive enzyme, that basically contains certain enzymes that that different parts of our gut produce, but you can but they, these are sourced from plants, you could take them as a supplement, and they can then help you absorb nutrients a little better. So that's one option. Sometimes again, too, um, even though, you know, the gallbladder is producing bile, which is very important for um, fat digestion and such, 
even if our gallbladder is removed and we're having difficulty digesting, it could still be helpful to think about the different pieces of the digestive system and supporting our stomach and digestive enzymes and also what's going on in the gut and maybe taking a probiotic. So some of that stuff may also be useful for even supporting your digestion after the gallbladder has been removed. And then I would also consider maybe even keeping a food diary for a, for a week or so and noticing certain foods that may trigger or aggravate um, bloating or indigestion or difficulty with bowel movement and that kind of thing. So that coming back to the, the dietary suggestions, a lot of time dairy products can be triggering um, or um, meat or other um, animal protein can be triggering. Not to say don't eat those, but maybe sometimes portioning or combining those with other foods may be better. And a lot of the time more um, plant-based fats like um, nuts, seeds, um, avocados and such tend to not and it's individual dependent, but those tend to sometimes not be as aggravating for digestion in folks who have had their gallbladders removed. And as kind of a, a broad generalization, making sure that we're getting more of our dietary fat from plant sources or from, from oily fish to like salmon and those high omega-3 fish, um, getting more fats from those sources and a little bit less from dairy and meat and such um, is favorable kind of from an overall health perspective and from a anti-inflammatory diet perspective too. Before we, we move on to the opposite of moving, not moving, <laughs> because I know that we have some people on here who have the complete opposite of that. You mentioned probiotics. Would you please share a little bit about, because we, you know, that's kind of like a, a buzzword in nutrition and, and I don't really understand it. I just know that it's supposed to be good for me. So can you please explain it to us? Yeah, that's a good question. Cause I think, I think that's a good way to label it. It is kind of a buzzword and sometimes it's really confusing. Like, what is this? How do I take it? What's the best thing to do? So probiotics literally are capsules or supplements that contain active bacterial cultures. And so these will contain different types and species of certain bacteria or sometimes certain types of yeast or beneficial um, yeast or fungi. And, and they can be for different purposes. So we have another very important buzzword that fits into this is the microbiome. So microbiome is a term that some people may have heard. And this is basically the term for this whole community of microbes that is in balance with our bodies. And so the microbiome doesn't exist just in the gut. It also exists on our skin. It exists in our um, genital urinary tracts. And so there's different important bacteria and other microbes that help keep those things in balance. So some of the strains that are super important for gut are different from those that may be helpful for vaginal health in a female. So probiotic supplements will generally contain these live bacteria. What type of probiotic or which strains or what dose will depend on for what you're taking it and what your medical history is. So just kind of a general thing, you'll typically find the dosing for probiotics is labeled as CFU. And it'll usually either be millions or more often billions of CFUs. So CFU stands for colony forming unit, which means that however many of that has, so say it may say 2 billion CFUs. So it means that that capsule contains 2 billion, 2 billion live optimum potency contains 2 billion live bacteria that have the potential to create a colony in your body, essentially. So it comes in these really high sounding numbers, but the amount that will actually do that cuts goes down significantly from the time that it's produced to when somebody buys it, takes it, it passes through their digestion and, and so on. So again, it kind of depends on for what you're taking it and what your medical history is on what dose you would use. Sometimes for, for more specific indications or say, for example, somebody is having inflammatory bowel disease or maybe having bowel issues due to chemotherapy or radiation. In some cases, we will actually use a prescription probiotic, which is the highest potency available on the market. It's called VisBiome. Um, it used to be called VSL3, but that's kind of been replaced by this VisBiome product. That's usually something you would get as a prescription from one of your um, doctors. So that we sometimes use more specifically as a medicine if somebody's having a you know, um, certain issue or something um, acutely triggered. Um, you can get all kinds of probiotics over the counter. Um, again, I would generally talk to one of your doctors or somebody on your health team about why you're taking it and what to look for. And then they can hopefully give you some guidance on that. For example, well, somebody had mentioned Culturel. So for just kind of as a general recommendation, Culturel is a pretty good quality 
brand that's very easy to find. So a lot of pharmacies and grocery stores um, have it all across the country. It's not overly expensive as compared to some other probiotics. So it's fairly affordable. Culturel produces those probiotics in a certain way that it maintains the live bacteria, keeps them alive, essentially in a in the appropriate form so that you're not getting kind of a supplement that's dead. So certain probiotics, you know, you'll see that they may either be on the shelf at the store, or they may be in the refrigerator. So especially for the ones that are on the shelf, they have to be produced in a certain form that keeps those bacteria alive. Um, the ones in the fridge, a lot of time that, that temperature and such keeps them alive. Because as those die off, because they are living organisms, they don't really do uh, much when we take them. So Culturel is a good brand where they do the appropriate production. So I did just real brief mention too, um, how, you know, there's, well, I mentioned there was certain strains of uh, bacteria or other beneficial microbes are useful. For example, the gut versus the genital urinary system. Oftentimes, if I have a patient, male or female, who's maybe having recurrent UTIs, sometimes that can be because of the, the, the microbiome in the genital urinary system. So there's specific probiotics that can be taken for, say, vaginal health or prostate health or urinary tract health. And those have specific um, species of bacteria that are particularly beneficial for those areas. So for example, for um, let's say specifically vaginal health for stuff like um, recurrent bacterial vaginosis or yeast infections, or in some cases, recurrent UTIs, there's actually studies showing that taking these specific strains of probiotics can actually help prevent some of those from coming back. So, so that's why I mentioned the you know type and um, species and all that is important too when you're selecting a probiotic. So ideal to to have some guidance when you're doing that. Would you mind kind of just touching on the opposite of the yes. the constip- you know on the opposite spectrum here about people who have particularly side effects from their treatment, the diarrhea. Mm-hmm. It's not just diarrhea; it's like now diarrhea. Mm-hmm. So is there any mm-hmm. way that you can give us some suggestions on what to do for something like that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So so with in terms of diarrhea, kind of opposite effect, and, and some of these things will apply to whether it's a side effect of medicine, or whether it's maybe a more on and off chronic issue, or whether it's even like an irritable bowel type of thing. Um, I'll stick I'm going to stay away from talking about any um, medications for that because that is a very individual thing, especially for diarrhea. If it's a side effect of medicine, but we'll talk about some other strategies. So one, so on that topic of probiotics, for some people, probiotics are a really helpful tool if you're having diarrhea, even if it's a side effect of treatment. So I will say caveat, if you are actively receiving chemotherapy or radiation, if you're going to take a probiotic, you do want to get the go ahead from either your integrative doctor or your oncologist or um, someone else. Because in the past, there's been kind of a, a general hesitancy for people who are actively receiving chemo to take probiotics. It was kind of more a theoretical thing of, oh, if I'm suppressing my immune system, do I want to take this live bacteria into my body? Could that be dangerous? There hasn't really been any research that has proven that. And um, for specific patients, sometimes I will have them take some of those higher potency probiotics or something over the counter. And I do have some folks that find that very beneficial. Would, that's one thing where I would go slowly um, and proceed with caution, like we had talked about with the aloe and other stuff. So I would probably start them on either a lower strength probiotic or, you know, one a day, whereas maybe the, the target dose is, is two or three a day and see how they do. But certainly a probiotic can be a helpful adjunct for diarrhea, even when it's during treatment, just that's something that you want to talk about with one of your doctors. Another really helpful supplement or a couple of things. I mean, this is something that is pretty safe. So if you're having diarrhea, but part of that is also stomach or intestinal cramping and that cramping discomfort before going or during the day, enteric coated peppermint oil can be a really helpful tool. So peppermint in general has this effect of calming the smooth muscles in the gut. So there's companies that have made supplements where it comes in this enteric coated capsule and it's just peppermint essential oil. Um, Nature's Way, that company with the little green leaf on the brand, that's kind of that's a pretty good quality company, and they do make one called Pepogest, P E P O G E S T, and you can get that at a lot of health food stores or also online. But it's just simply um, peppermint oil in a in an enteric coated capsule, and so that can be taken to kind of con that cramping discomfort. So that can be a useful tool. 
as well. Interestingly, um, green and black tea, particularly if they're decaffeinated, contain a compound called tannins and tannins can also slow down gut motility to some degree. So if you do decaf green or black tea, that can be helpful as well. And they say decaf just because caffeine can be a stimulant. So that can, they can kind of cancel each other out. But green tea certainly has a lot of health benefits um, in addition. So that could be something useful to include. Um, if the small amount of caffeine doesn't bother you, you could even get just a regular um, organic green tea and continue to steep it multiple times. So after that first cup, mostly caffeine is, is gone, but you can continue to get a lot of those other beneficial nutrients as you continue to steep it, even when the water looks almost clear. So that could be useful. Chamomile is something that can also be helpful. That is more for upper GI calming, but chamomile tea is a great um, nervous system relaxer and chamomile can be helpful for acid reflux. But the reason why I mentioned chamomile when we're talking about diarrhea is that because of that upper GI calming, and because it can calm the nervous system that, you know, for stressed or anxious, I can further aggravate loose stools. The other really important thing I would always think about is uh, dietary triggers. So one big one in terms of it, first, first of all, think about, you know, processed foods and artificial sweeteners and dyes. Those are big triggers for a lot of people. I do always have to put in the one plug of if there was one food product that I would recommend everybody eventually try to avoid it would be artificial sweeteners. So that would be like any diet drinks or um, zero calorie drinks that are sweet. So that would be like aspartame, sucralose, Splenda, that type of stuff. So there's actually a recent study, I think that came out of Stanford that showed that just a single serving of uh, artificial sweetener created irreversible damage to the gut microbiome. And so not to like freak people out, a lot of us encounter these artificial sweeteners, but usually when I talk with folks, my focus is more on what's all the good stuff we can add to our diets, but that's the one single thing I will try to encourage people to take out entirely if they can, or slowly work on taking out. But artificial sweeteners can be a big trigger for diarrhea, but in terms of more kind of healthy foods we may have in our diet, it can be useful to, to look at what's included and what may be triggering it. The one kind of number one healthy food that is an often a trigger for people that we may not think about is dairy products. So whether it's cow's milk or cream or cheese, especially dairy products that are not cultured or fermented. So cultured dairy would include like yogurt, kefir, aged cheese, um, feta, stuff like that. And cultured means that they actually have that probiotic in them. And so that's why they're cultured foods. So those tend to digest a bit better. But if we drink a regular glass of milk or eat ice cream, that can be more inflammatory in the gut for a lot of people, not for everybody, but for a lot. Yeah. Meat generally, especially red meat, but even other mm -hmm. lean forms of meat are just are just tougher to digest, so yes. especially if your gut's already under stress. Um, and certainly doing a, eating a little bit less meat and more plant source proteins is favorable even just for um, from an anti-cancer perspective too. So that can be really helpful, bearing in mind that we can get plenty of protein from plants and we're, you know, we're most often not lacking in that in our diets. Oh, good. Thank you. Hey, Debbie asked if there are any essential oils you would recommend other than peppermint oil. Um, so in terms of ingesting um, essential oils, that's the only one I would recommend kind of across the board. One thing to keep in mind, because it's kind of become popular to ingest essential oils, but I would caution that essential oils are really potent medicines. So these are hyper, hyper concentrated medicinal parts of plants. So I would treat them just like I would any medication too. So I'm not super comfortable recommending ingestion of essential oils, but in terms of topical use or diffusing in the home, I think that's absolutely fine. So a lot that are really great, like lavender is wonderful for relaxation. There's certain essential oil combinations that are great for respiratory health. I would try to get more pure formulas. So we'll look for ones that don't have other additives and such in them. Somebody mentioned frankincense. That's a great anti-inflammatory too. So in terms of topical use or diffusion, I think that's totally fine. If you are applying them topically, always put them, um, dilute them in a base oil. So again, because these are so, so concentrated, you generally don't want to drop a uh, full, full blown essential oil on your skin because that's going to irritate it. You'd want to put a few drops in coconut oil or almond oil or something else and then use that. About oh, yeah. frankincense, so um, if you get an ingestible form of frankincense, would you feel it's dangerous, like one drop, one or two drops in like a 16 ounce bottle of water? So like a I would be terra about, or one of those? Yeah, like, I would be a little cautious about just putting the drop in water and drinking it. Because again, that's 
that that strong compound is passing through your whole gut. So whether it could create a little irritation as it goes down into the gut, maybe. So for more ingestible use, again, generalizations and not for everybody. The other name for frankincense is Boswellia. Boswellia, um, yeah, so the I Boswellia take that. Is a, yeah, so that's a great anti-inflammatory. So usually then that would have other parts of the plant in it too, and you would take that as supplement form. So I would probably do more of that. And then yeah, it's just another well pill. That's why I was asking at least yeah. to know about the frankincense. At least it's yeah, in that's, water, a, that's a good point though. Thank good you. Good question. I would be just a little cautious about putting drops of essential oils in. I stopped because I did feel like I was, I felt a burning sensation. I was just putting okay. one or two drops in that bottle, but I did stop. But I was wondering about it because I take, you know, other type of supplements and it would just been one more pill, but I ended up yeah. having to go for the Boswellia. Yeah. So gotcha. thank you. Yeah. Good question. Great. Good. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. I have one last, one last request of you, Dr. H. Dr. H is here mm -hmm. in Charlotte, North Carolina. She's at Levine Cancer Institute, Atrium Health. So if you are in Charlotte, would we just reach out to you? You are, you're in the integrative medicine department, correct? Would you mind yep. sharing with everyone else? Because we have people from all over the globe here. And if I want you as my physician or someone like you on my, on my medical team, how do I do that? Where do I find someone like you? So, so one good baseline is you can even just, you know, Google search integrative medicine physician in your area. One thing I would be cautious of is always make um, check what that person's credentials are. So for example, you can look up board certified integrative medicine physician. So for example, I'm a board certified integrative medicine. So that means I've, you know, taken all the standard um, that would be for in the US, it may be different in other countries, the US specifically does have a board certification for integrative medicine. You can, if you are, uh, I think even if you're not in the United States, if you go to Andrew Weil Center for Integrative Medicine, he's kind of the father of integrative medicine. He's a, a Harvard trained medical doctor. So he has had, he had a fellowship training program for over a decade. So any physician who has done training with that program is in um, their database. So you can look up Andrew Weil Center for Integrative Medicine and find a provider. And that those people are not necessarily just in the US. So anybody, I have classmates who are from Brazil and Australia and other places that so you can look on there and find anybody who's done that training. There are now other training programs, but um, there's probably more than I could name, but that's the oldest one that's trained the most integrative providers. So that's a good start. And then I would caution too, people can use the term integrative and they may not be a medical doctor or a, a DO or similar. So I would just be cautious about that. Not to say that other people using that term are not qualified, but you just want to know what somebody's baseline training is. For example, um, an, an ND or naturopathic doctor has a lot of training in botanical medicines and such. I would trust that person with that information. But if it is maybe a chiropractor, I would want to know if they're giving me supplement suggestions, I would know what, what want to know what their background training is and how they know to recommend supplements versus, you know, an integrative doctor or a naturopathic doctor who, you know, by, by definition will have that training. So, so just a caution. Okay. It's just always know what someone's background is. Okay. So if someone wants to have you on their team, you're part of the team. You're not the new, you, you work with the oncologist and every, you work with that patient's whole team. Is that correct? Yep. So with, so a lot of cancer centers, including ours, um, have an integrative oncology department. So that's something you can look at, especially if you're getting care at a somewhat larger center, but even smaller ones often have that or are connected with the place that does that. Um, so you would look for integrative oncology. I am part of somebody's cancer care team. So they will still have an oncologist. I'm not an oncologist. I'm an integrative medicine doctor. So what, kind of by definition too, integrative oncology, one of the goals is to optimize people's treatment and care. So we're not like alternative medicine doctors where they see us or their oncologists. We're very much a team where we all work together. And so Wonderful. a lot of cancer centers have that. So I encourage you to check um, wherever you are. Wonderful. Thank you. I, I wanted to make sure that everyone knew where they could go to find someone like you who does the kind of work that you do. So 